Good morning. Good morning. Happy to have you guys here this morning with us. Obviously, this morning looks a little different. Uh, we're excited to share with you. Um, we figured what better way uh, to close out a series on identity uh, than to actually answer questions you actually have, not questions we think you might have. Um, and so we opened it up. Uh, we heard from you guys and what's, what God's doing in your lives and, and what he's put on your hearts. And we said, hey, you know what? We just want to respond to these things. We want to give a biblical pastoral response to these things. And so um, I hope and pray, and we have been praying that this is a, a beneficial time uh, for you and for your family. And um, I, I really believe that it will be uh, a really wonderful uh, time to, together this morning. I'm excited because we have... Every generation represented on the panel, which is awesome, and I think that represents great health on our teaching team. <laughs> what was that? I missed something. They, yeah. they kind of guessed which one yeah. I am. Yeah. Right. No, they know. They were saying in their brain. Oh, 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we got the boomers, we got the Gen Z, we got, we got everybody around here, which I'm excited for. I think that um, is, is a similar vibe in our church. I think we represent all generations as well, and I think it's just a beautiful thing to have everybody come together in unity, in Christ, uh, to share in, in his word. So we're going to go through it. We have seven questions uh, that we um, r we received more. We're only able to, we think, get through seven. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to jump through those this morning and... Uh, yeah, let me just uh, pray over this before we get dive in. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I just invite you uh, into this space, into, Lord, speak into our hearts, um, direct us by your word. Um, uh, no answer uh, that man has to offer uh, is, is, is <laughs> worth listening to unless it's uh, rooted in your word. And so, um, Lord, help us to do that well. Um, lead us, remind us of what your word says as we uh, discuss these difficult questions. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for saving sinners like me. See your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So first question came in is, how do I figure out who I really am? Mm. I like that. Yeah. I thought you were going there. <laughs> <laughs> If I, if I could just lay a foundation, and again, this is from the old guy. Um, it really doesn't matter in the end who you think you are. Um, you must take by faith who God says that you are. And that's the foundation, I think, behind our answer is Absolutely. Um, our whole culture is all about, um, you know, what I feel or what I think or what someone's telling me. And it, that's why there's so much confusion. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, we, we forget to look at Scripture. I mean, Matthew 10 is one of them, right? It says he just takes care of every creature, and they're clothed beautifully, and he, and he, and he just he feeds them, and he takes care of them. And he finishes that by going, aren't you worth so much more? We forget that because we go by our feelings and not by the truth of what he says. And, uh, and we miss that. We need, to, we need to really understand that you're absolutely right. What God says your worth is, not how we feel. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to remember that God made mankind uniquely in his image. And so there's a, because of the image, there, we are sort of set apart from the rest of creation in the sense of having inherent dignity, value, worth, like all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. um, simply because of what we are. It's called the imago dei. Right, and it's why we view things like abortion as being so abhorrent, is because yeah. that's that's a person, right? right? Every human being is made in the image of God and is worthy of those things. But going beyond that, like you guys have been saying, we see all over the New Testament that being justified means that we are God's workmanship, that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we're co-heirs with Him, and that we are adopted by God. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a joyful truth. And when we when we truly accept that, we can have joy and assurance in how God sees us. And it doesn't mean we won't struggle with self-worth, um, especially in an age that where everyone's attention is monetized, right? Self-worth self issues abound. But when we ground ourselves in, in how we view ourselves and who God says that we are, yeah. um, we get that confidence that is lasting and never changing. That's good. I see there being a lot of 
a pain in that question because it's someone who feels like they've lost their identity. And that happens when you put your identity in something that changes. And we've all done that. You, you might have your identity in your work, identity as a parent, um, countless number of things. And then when that goes away, that's when you're left with that question. So I feel, I feel the pain of that question because it's like, who, who am I really in this place? Because I've wrapped myself so much up into this personality or into this way of life. Hmm. That's good. So let's say I'm that person, <laughs> right? Like, could you guys just lead me, lead me to, to Christ, lead me to that new identity? Mm. How do I get there? Admit that you have a problem. Hmm. <laughs> First step to solving a problem is admitting you have one, right? <laughs> um, admit that, you know, Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved. But before that, he calls us children of wrath. Yeah. Right, And so having that knowledge that you are a child of wrath first brings you into that grace and understanding um, of who Christ says that you are. So yeah. that's the first step. Yeah, I was going to say, you're in a good place when you ask that question because at the end of yourself, you're finally ready to find the start of Jesus. Yeah. And so you got to step into that and, and to what he has for you. In Second Corinthians, it says, we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. But then right after that, it says, well, first, be reconciled to God. So mm -hmm. getting your identity found in Christ starts with being reconciled with him and not pushing it off. It's interesting. It's, uh, I'll let you go, but it's interesting because I think oftentimes when I ask that question, t lead me there, right? I think we assume I'm an unbeliever, but I think what we've discovered throughout the identity series is that I'm not necessarily an unbeliever. This question is not necessarily coming from an unbeliever. I think oftentimes it can come from a Christian that's lost their way, right? And so leading us back to that. Um, if, if, to your point, if God can take me and, and say, I was a child of wrath, this is who you were, but now you're this, you're mine, you are my son, you are adopted, you are a, a, a co-heir with Christ, right, these amazing things, then I understand inherently that, that if I fall as a believer, that he can also pick me back up, right, and I think that we could celebrate in his grace and his mercy in our lives, grace upon grace upon grace. I think the key is who are you listening to, right, and that's why the teens that are in this room if your parents are seeking to limit what you're watching what you're listening to the devices that you carry you need to thank God for them as much as it's irritating and you think that it's so confining because those voices are giving you messages that create the kind of confusion that bring you to a place where you're saying all right am I this gender or not and you know the questions just cascade from there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, careful who you're who you're listening to. Yeah, that's all that's <laughs> exactly what I was gonna say was uh, if you want to know who you are, look at the word of the guy who created you. He tells you who you are. If you're if you're wondering who you are and what you're doing is seeking that anywhere but in his word, you're gonna find lies. You're not gonna find the truth. Yeah. Gotta be in here. Then yeah. you'll know who you are kind of like what we did this morning, right? Dad came in here listen, talking, talking about T-Swift. We had to rebuke him <laughs> yes, for right. that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, get, get that stuff out of here. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I listen to her all the time, of course. That's <laughs> <laughs> how you stay young. Just roll, just roll your windows up. That's all I ask. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Pastor Steve is a Swifty. <laughs> <laughs> Can I change seats with you? No, all right. <laughs> All right, well, you're having fun now. <laughs> Let's get to the second question. Oh, boy. Uh, question number two. As a believer, how do I balance politics and faith? Mm. We're, just, we're just going right into that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's important that every Christian has to remember that their faith informs their politics and not the other way around. Um. Yep. And I think we've lost the plot a little bit on that. Many political philosophies uh, seat man and the state in the place of God, and it's imperative that we reject these ideas when, when we come across them. Um, Francis Schaeffer famously said, if there is no God above the state, then the state is God and must assume all responsibilities and attributes of God. I don't know about you, but that's a terrifying thought. Um, and so it's important that no matter the issue, we take every thought captive 
and we hold it up against God's revelation. Mm -hmm. So Colossians 1 says that Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together, Amen. right? So no matter the result of an election or a legislative vote, we know that all of it is a part of God's sovereign plan to exercise his grace and mercy on us, right? Um, and also his justice and holiness as well. Mm -hmm. um, God, God can use these things to exercise his judgment. Um, but when we accept this and we accept God's sovereignty over all these things, this is the peace that is beyond all understanding, right? Um, that even the bad things have their purpose um, and, and their part in the plan. It's not just meaningless evil, right? So mm, that's good. That's good. Well, I, yeah, I think that goes into First Peter 2, uh, which, talks, which tells us to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. It's not the only place in Scripture that tells us that. We don't like that very much because if we don't like what's happening in the government— we would rather be like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. But, but this is being written in a time when Christians are being killed. Okay? This is a time when it's not good. Yeah. And he's saying, submit yourselves to the governing authorities. Be why? Why? It says, for the Lord's sake. Right? So that you will be shown above reproach. God has placed all authority on earth. He's put it there. He's allowed it. It didn't surprise him. The last election didn't go the way it did, and God was like, darn, that, mm, I missed that one, mm -hmm. right? Man. He put them there. All authority on earth is allowed by him, mm -hmm. and he's called us to submit to it, right? Yeah. And that's a hard one. Now, obviously, if they tell us to reject Christ, that's different, but that's not what's happening. But we still, we don't like the submit to the authority part. Yeah, I, I think, guys... Uh, Part of this question relates to the fact that we're in an election um, this year, and I need to put it out there. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. God doesn't have a candidate at stake in this election. In fact, I think that we are looking at two very, very flawed people. And so if you're one who thinks that God has somebody picked out. Um, he may, in fact, do that because God has, throughout the ages, used flawed people to accomplish his purpose. But please don't think just because someone, for example, sells a $60 Bible that has the Constitution in it, that that is some major sign that God is on that side. He, he's not. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing, folks. And what the church often does is, is we, we take the subtext and we get caught up in all of the little details when what we need to do is, is keep the main thing the main thing. And the, the, the point is, for example, in the abortion issue, it's life. God is the author of life, and he alone has the ability to create life. Only he can uh, rightfully end life. It's not about six weeks or 15 weeks or any of these other side issues that get us in the gnarly details. God has a plan. He is sovereign, and by the way, there's not much about our nation in the end times, so that ought to tell you just how much he has a stake in what's happening. I think we've seen it. Kings have tried to interrupt God's plans before. This is not, the, the, we're not new to this idea. And last I checked, they've, they've failed <laughs> every step of the way. So Absolutely. In God we trust, not in man we trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, I wanted to share, I grew up in a very patriotic household as a child, which is, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, but I was often confused about who is the higher authority. Was it the president or was it God? And, mm. um, and I feel like that wasn't intentional in my family. It was just something that happened. And um, it was just because I was, I was told that politics was where my hope was, and that was the hope for a transformed world rather than Jesus being the hope for a transformed world. Wow. And so if that speaks to anyone, I just would, would call us to make sure we're setting our priorities right. And maybe it's not even so much a balance of politics and faith, but a proper placement of where they are and which one's higher than the other and remembering that Amen. that's a that's a good that's good stuff guys i think the only thing i would add is you know matthew 6 jesus says that seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and i think that 
that sentence alone helps me align with my politics and faith, right? Um, my faith and politics and then politics. Um, uh, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I think we see who, where, where, what, what are you more passionate about? And I think we need to identify that self. I've, I've had to call myself out on that many times where I'm like, why are you so passionate about this? But you're not wanting to do this over here in the church. Like, like I'm, I've called myself on that many times where my priorities are jacked up. And um, so we got to fix that. And I think if we're going to talk about, you know, we didn't talk about voting or anything like that. But I think that's this aligns with my voting process as well. Vote righteousness. That's, that's what I try to do as much as possible in all ways. I try to vote righteousness in. Um, as best you can, and I know it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but um, it, it's certainly what I try to do, so. Mm -hmm. Cool. If I could say one other thing. Yes. Uh, our culture is going down the toilet. We all know that's true. But folks, that's the plan. If you haven't read lately, in the last days, there will be terrible times. In the last days, scoffers will come and turn everything upside down. So if you see everything going, as they used to say, to hell in a handbasket, that's how God said it was going to be. Now, we don't become subservient little slaves to this. Yes, we vote. Yes, we work to bring about change to the point that we can. But again, his kingdom is not of this world. Let's serve the king who is king over all other kings. Keep in mind, too, it's, it's great. Keep in mind, too, who's, who's watching? I don't know that we ask ourselves this enough. Um, check your fear. Check your fear. Um, uh, perspective matters. And I say that because uh, my daughter, she's 18. She gets to vote for the first time this, mm -hmm. this, in this election. This is her first time voting. And she's actually excited about it, and she's actually optimistic about the future. And so um, wow. check, check, check your fear. Um, and as um, older, more seasoned believers, are we, um, are we kind of inflicting others with our fearfulness of the future, or are we confident in the one who's going to do what he says he's going to do, therefore we can lead with confidence and we can we can press that upon others. So um, just word. keep that in mind as well. Yep. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Um, how can I be one person in all areas of my life? Mm. I, I mean, follow the good shepherd, right? Uh, Philippians chapter two, verses three through eight, uh, tells us that Christ counted others more significant than himself. Mm to the point where he didn't even count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, right? Um, instead, he humbles himself by serving others and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, right? Um, so Paul encourages us to follow that same example of self-sacrificial humility. We talk about self-sacrifice a lot here, um, and, and that's really what it means um, to, to be one person in all areas of your life, right? If you're seeking to follow Christ's example of humility, that, consistent, that consistency is going to come with time. Yeah. You're going to fall. You're not going to you're not going to follow him perfectly, right? But as you go on, as time goes on, as you continue to walk with the Lord, you look more and more like him and praise God for it. That's good. I love that you say that cuz in Matthew 6, um, he talks about the fact that you cannot serve two masters. Mm -hmm. You can only serve one. Yeah. So, if there is anything else in your life that you are chasing after like you chase are supposed to be chasing after God, you have you have another master. And it's not God. James right? calls that double-minded. Yes. So that if you say, how, do, how can I be the same person in all of my life? If work or play or whatever, um, if, you, if you're going to softball like I do every Tuesday and all of a sudden I look like all those guys that I'm playing softball with, I'm there because I want to fit in, I got to ask myself, who am I serving? Am I serving God? Because if I am, then I should look exactly the same there as I do when I'm with you guys right here. There's uh, some question. Oh, I, felt the, I felt the pull of that being a teacher for 15 years, and summer would come, and I would forget who I was because I had spent 10 months being a teacher that's also a Christian and not a Christian that's also a teacher. And I'd spend the summer finding myself, and I'd grow closer to God, and then I'd just watch that slowly fade away as my kingdom of my classroom and my persona and who I am and all the hats that I'm wearing, so many hats that I can't clear the doorway that I forget who I am. So yeah. um, my, my response to that was in Psalm 86, David, I, I feel like David has the same 
same feel. And because David's got all these hats and he's all these different people to all these, he means so many things to different people. And he says, in a prayer to God, he says, unite my heart. Um, and he's, it starts with prayer. It starts with the fact that you can't be one person in all areas of your life until you ground yourself in Christ. Mm. I, part of the question that, that really concerned me is it, it seemed to me as though this is someone that has slipped into a works-based righteousness. You know, what can I do to be so consistent that I make God smile? Well, the gospel says that you are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based upon the word of God alone. And so, uh, first of all, let me just say, give yourself a break. I don't think you can be one person in all areas of your life. Even the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, you need to read that if you haven't read it. It's the last half of the chapter Paul says, man, I'm unspiritual. Things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Woe is me. I'm a wretched man. Who's going to rescue me? And so the point is not be good with your craven sinfulness. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there, there are two natures that you have within you. Now that you are in Christ, you not only have that sin nature that Eli talked about, you also have the nature of Christ, the nature of your new life, and they are going to be doing this until Jesus comes. Amen. You'll never get old enough that you won't want to do what you shouldn't ought to do. <laughs> so, Speaking from the <laughs> senior from guy From personal on here, experience, absolutely. The guy on here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I love that. I think if I'm hearing anything, though, in our lifestyles and in the way we were living and following Christ, all the mistakes seem to happen when we disconnect and we, we misunderstand who is in charge, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it really is that simple, right? Things go haywire in my house when my kids forget who is in charge, <laughs> and I think the Lord's house is no different, right? And, and I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, sanctification is God's work, not your work, right? He, you're, you're, you're his handiwork, not your own handiwork, right? And I know we're throwing out big church words. Sanctification is like, God is holy. He's going to save you, right? Because you're unholy, but he's going to make you holy, right? And, and it's just this process that he's working out in you, and it looks different in all of us. I would be the first to say, I actually was serving the Lord in the church, walking in sin that some would even say was disqualifying. But I didn't, the Lord called me, and I was trying to be obedient to that, but the Lord hadn't, the, the sanctification hadn't met the calling yet, right? And so I was so lost in that space, but the Lord was so faithful, and it wasn't about what I was doing, because I tried it, and I failed, but it wasn't until the Lord decided to take it away, and that's when it happened, and that's when it changed. It's not even been, a, it, it doesn't even come in my head anymore. I don't even care. It's completely gone, so trust him with that process in you. Don't try to work it out yourself, right? Meet him in his word. Be faithful in your prayer life, right? And come and worship the one that saved your soul and let him deal with all the rest. So when you said that other people might consider it disqualifying, mm -hmm. did you think it was disqualifying? At times. Yeah. At times. Because for me, it was like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting hit with these questions that I, can, I, I have an answer, but I'm not listening to my own answer. Mm -hmm. I'm a hypocrite. Right? So I'm going home. I'm like convicted, not by the word, but because I'm preaching the word that I'm not listening to. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely convicted by that. And that actually, but I think the Lord wanted that for, for me because it shaped my ministry. Yeah. Right? So, because I won't get up here. I, 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 I cannot get up here and say something if I'm not willing to just wrestle with it on Tuesday in my office at home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So the warfare yeah. for me happens on Tuesday. Yeah. For me, uh, as I preached through the years, a recognition of my personal sin often was the greatest burden to mm. me getting in the pulpit. Um, but the presence of sin is not a disqualifier. It's the unwillingness to confess that sin. And so what I did um, in order to handle that is I came to believe that God can work with um, a dirty pipe 
as long as it's not plugged, mm. right? Mm. So the spirit can flow through even someone who has sinned. Confess it, lay it before the Lord, have somebody in your life that you're accountable to. All those things are so vital. But again, we're back into kind of a works righteousness. I knew you were struggling, but I also trusted that God was going to fix all that, right? Yeah. And yep. it, he was going to do it in his time because I trusted your heart. I believed that that was the direction that it would go. Yeah, that's big. What is the Christian worldview of race? Okay, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> See you next Sunday. <laughs> uh, well, in Acts chapter 17, um, Paul is preaching and he reminds us that all of the nations come from one man, mm. Adam. So if you go b back far enough, we all share a common ancestor. Okay, so an us versus them mentality when it comes to race makes no sense from a Christian perspective. There's yeah. no place for it in the Christian yeah. worldview. Um, yep. Not to mention... Amen. <laughs> I like him. He's, ex he's, he's excited, excited about that. I am too. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, not to mention, the, the whole linchpin of Paul's ministry is that salvation has been made available to all kinds of men, Amen. right? For all mankind. This doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge, respect, and learn from one another's differences because obviously the differences are there. But it does mean that any form of racial superiority or hostility, mm. like white privilege, as, as an example, is completely foreign to the biblical worldview. Mm. Okay, um, that's that's a Marxist ideal. It's antichrist. We reject that. That's not not okay. Um, especially in the church, Jesus prayed we would all be united under Him. Mm. Um, and so we do well to remember our Lord's wishes at the end of the day. Well said. Mm -hmm. Well said. Mm. I like to remember that in heaven it says that Jesus ransomed people of God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Beautiful picture there. No, that's good. Yeah, I, um, just so you guys know, if you haven't noticed already, we did include scripture references that we would uh, believe would be helpful to you. Um, so you can you can use those and go study on your own. But everything that we're saying is rooted in that. Um, we, like I said, we don't operate from our own wisdom; we operate from His and. Um, I think of Acts 10, right? Um, uh, no partiality, no, no favoritism. Um, and I, I think if God is that way, then you should be too. Yep. Galatians 3 says the same, same thing, right? No Jew, or not Jew or Gentile, slave or free, all male right. or female. God, Jesus came to save all. That's right. All. And yeah. so you shouldn't look at it any differently. Paul says, Paul says that Jesus came to break down every wall, every dividing wall of hostility, mm -hmm. and create in himself one new man in place of the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, first of all, race happened um, as far as diversity took place because of sin. Right. Man thought he could be God, <laughs> tried to build a tower to the heavens, and God scattered them with language and with location. And that's how it all began. But again, we're still rooted in the same mother and father, right? But um, one of the problems that the church ran into, but it also has given us clarity for, uh, for 2,000 years of church history, is the fact that from the beginning, everybody was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. Those in the upper room, the 120, they were Jewish. Every single one of the 3,000 believers on Pentecost were also Jewish. And so for a short period of time, there was an assumption that if you wanted to follow Christ, you had to become Jewish first, and then you could follow Jesus after that. Until, and Josh mentioned Acts 10, along comes this dude named Cornelius. He was called a Gentile. And by the way, that's who you are too, okay? Mm -hmm. You're a Gentile, which means until this was clarified, you and I would be out. But Cornelius, he heard about Jesus, wanted to know more about Jesus, and so an angel sent Peter to go talk to him. Peter didn't want to do it, and so Peter's up on the roof one day, he's hungry, and this blanket of food, all of it 
considered unclean according to the Old Testament law. This blanket came down and the angel said, rise, Pete, slay and eat, something like that. And, <laughs> and Peter said, no, it's unclean. And that went a couple of times. Finally, Peter understood that the message was about the kingdom being bigger than he ever understood. And he said this, he said, you are well aware it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me through that time on the roof that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Mm. None. That opened the door, folks. That broke down the dividing wall of hostility between the races. And... So what you're saying is, is that what we should do is we, sh as Christians, we should see the person God created, loves, and wants to have a relationship with. That's how we should see each and every person. Isn't it frustrating? I mean, it is for me, right? Every, we, we talk about the fruits of the Spirit, right? You mentioned Galatians, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like we look at that, and many Christians can just haul off and just let that out, right? But then we somehow accept behavior tolerant of the opposite of that in some of these different areas, right? Politics come up, race comes up. All of a sudden, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where's the fruit, right? And I just, I, man, I reject that. Like, if you're walking by the Spirit, you'll bear fruit, period. Mm -hmm. So if you're not bearing fruit, you ain't walking by the Spirit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it crazy um, how we, all these issues that the world likes to make so complicated, I feel like that was the easiest question we've answered so far. Yeah, they <laughs> usually, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, why let are me, we talking about this? <laughs> well, let me hit you with a different one. Let me ask a harder one. How do I overcome a father wound? Mm. You, you probably never will mm. in totality. Um, those wounds run deep um, and will likely be with you for the balance of your life, but you can come to a place with Christ's help where those wounds no longer haunt you. And in fact, you can leverage them even. And I'm speaking as one who knew father wounds very deeply, very personally you can leverage those for the sake of the gospel as a testimony for, of God's power of life change. So I really don't know that you can erase mm -hmm. such deep wounds, but you can leverage them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's Thank good. you. I think, in, I think I love that. I think you're right. Um, I think one of the ways you do that, though, it goes back to the first question, too. How do I figure out who I really am? Well, mm -hmm. those father wounds can affect the way you see God the Father, right? Um, but you, you have to go back and understand who he is and how he loves you. I mean, in James 1, it talks about how every good and perfect gift comes from above. Like, he wants great things for you. He wants wonderful things for you. We've, we've talked about it in this series. He's adopted you as his own son or daughter if you know him, if you've accepted Christ. He wants to make you an heir of the kingdom. An heir. I mean, all of these wonderful things, but you have to accept them. You can say, well, yeah, it's great. I read it. Wonderful. Well, okay, but there comes a point where you have to believe it. You have to accept it. You can fight it all day long and fight it all day long and let those past wounds um, just continue to batter the truth or you can accept the truth of who God says you are not just who he says you are it is who you are he loves you and, and you've got to you got to get his word in there you've got to be putting in there constantly it's, it's just like if you had a great father who was telling you I love you giving you hugs doing things for you that's what God's doing are you willing to accept that?
be yeah. willing to let that overcome those wounds. I think that's good. I think, uh, you know, we get a special opportunity to speak on this, too, because you come from a place where you, you spoke to your father wound, right? But I don't have a father wound, right? So what did God do? Well, it appears as if he is setting a new trend in our family and he used you to set that trend mm. right and that trend is now echoing to me and my, my approach is now echoing to my son and and I pray and hope that his approach will echo yeah. to his son so you've reshaped generations by pulling us back mm. to obedience to the Lord and love for Christ and that just shows you what God can do through a man that has a heart open to him he can change families he can change lives yeah. you know Amen. Yeah. thank you bro. I, I don't know if this comes up a lot for you guys pastorally, but I see this often, um, is I think a lot of people, <sighs> forgiveness is something we throw out quickly, but I do think that the, the key recipe here is to forgive. But I think where we often mess up, a lot of believers feel like a guilt to remain in the relationship. And, and I just, I want to speak to anybody who's in that situation. I want to speak to free you up, if I could, that forgiveness doesn't always mean that the relationship continues. Um, I, I think that boundaries are, are, are more than appropriate. I've had to uh, often set those with people I love and would rather not have boundaries with, but I've had to do that to protect my heart, to protect the hearts of those that I'm, I'm tasked with leading. And so I think keep that in mind that forgiveness doesn't always mean uh, that we're going to be uh, BFs right, for life. Um, it, it, it just means that you're releasing your heart from uh, any bitter root being able to grow up within you, and then you're also establishing some boundaries to help protect you uh, from being hurt again. It doesn't. Now, here's the deal, though. If you're a believer, I do believe that you always have to be willing to open the door again to try. Now, that's where the line is, right? You can't shut it off all the way, and I think that's a that's that's an important thing as well. Well, I mean, I would say as what well, I mean, I'm I'm kind of I guess we're speaking a lot. I'll throw this out there. Forgive the father that hurt you so that your heavenly father can heal you. And I believe that mm. I believe that he will. I believe that he is faithful to do this, but I believe that our heavenly father wants to see your heart move in that forgiveness direction and I believe that when you when you do that, that healing can begin and that process can begin in you. Um, and so just be faithful to that and step in. I know it's scary. So. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, what does it mean to be more than conquerors? Now we're going to have to kind of accelerate through here, but let's just, let's do a speed one here and then we'll close with this last one. Well, I love this because uh, in Romans 8, it taught Jesus has already conquered sin and death. He's already done it, right? So when you ask how are we more than conquerors, well, we're more because we're not the conquerors. <laughs> we didn't do any conquering at all. We just came and accepted what Jesus already conquered. He conquered it. We said, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now we become heirs, yeah. right? Now we become adopted sons, adopted daughters. We don't do the fight. Have you seen, uh, have you seen the movie up. Troy? Tro yeah. With yeah. Brad Pitt? Yeah, yeah. Amazing movie. Yeah. Get pumped about it. But you remember the sword scene mm -hmm. where they're like, let's put your best against our best? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> and so the whole <laughs> army of Troy is there. And then I forget who they're fighting, but they're there too. And then the big giant, it's like Goliath, but like David with a sword instead of a sling. It's yep. awesome. And then he like, he runs and he's like going full speed and then just like right in the and neck. It's over. <laughs> over. And he's just down. Awesome movie scene. But that's how I picture this more than conquerors. It's like, that army didn't earn that nope. victory. They're just sitting back there. <laughs> Brad Pitt did. Right? It was Achilles. So like, Come on. <laughs> Jesus is our Brad Pitt, right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Sorry. And uh, have a great week, everyone. I might, yeah, I might, need, to, I might need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on? You know, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I read something. Uh, John, John Piper wrote about this phrase. Um, he said, a conqueror defeats his enemy, but one who is more than a conqueror subjugates. That is, he crushes, he mm. vanquishes, just like Brad Pitt, <laughs> uh, <laughs> his enemy. A conqueror nullifies the purpose of his enemy, but, listen to this, one who is more than a conqueror makes the enemy serve his own purposes. He makes the foe 
his sleigh. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was referencing back with a father wound. You can take that wound and transform it into a trophy in tribute to the glory and grace and power of our God. Mm. In fact, he most often uses our greatest weaknesses to do exactly that. Amen. I would just say that being more than a conqueror means that we get to face the trials of life with certainty that we are not alone. We have a mighty father who goes before us and never leaves us or forsakes us. He is for us and not against us, and he promises that we can overcome anything when we lean on him. And so we approach the darkest valleys uh, with confidence, knowing that nothing can happen that is not permitted by our loving Father for our good. That's good. That's good. Well, let me, um, let me read our last question. I think we have plenty of time for it, Eli, right? Yeah. I know we're technically we're technically where over, we should but be, okay. but we can do one more. You guys want to do one more? Yeah. All, All right. right. Let's do one more. Um, what is your advice for someone to become a more dedicated Christian? That's an awesome question. Um, I mean, yeah, I love the heart behind it. This one came in from a youth student. There you go. Nice. Awesome. That's cool. Um, Let's go. Do your reps. Um, I mean, any, Denzel, Denzel Washington says anything you practice, you'll get good at. Mm. Right? And so practicing imitating Christ with the knowledge that you're going to fall way short and be in need of his grace um, it is key. Get to know your heavenly father. I mean, how do you get to know someone? By spending time with them, mm -hmm. right? Get in his word, read what he says about himself, what he says about you and about the others around you. Pray, pray a lot and pray messy prayers. We talk, we act like we got to like be all proper when we come to God. Like, no, like be messy. Just yeah. tell him how you're feeling. Yeah. Um, so many folks think they got to sound all proper and nice, but God already knows you're faking that. So you might as well just be real. <laughs> Surround yourself with godly fellowship with people whose faith you look up to. Um, I've learned a lot from that and, and learn to take correction from them. Hmm. Humble yourself and serve your family and others. And you will be following Christ. <laughs> so, yeah. That's good. That's good. You know, this one has been uh, a struggle for me throughout uh, much of my life because um, I'm, until uh, I got older, um, I wasn't a very planned person. I just kind of did things as they came, and, and uh, I, I remembered everything, and I would just, I'd know what I needed to do in my day. I wouldn't write it down. I wouldn't do times for it, and what I started to realize was that meant that I wasn't planning my time with the Lord, so guess what got put on the chopping block most of the time was my time with the Lord, and if I had done that with my wife when I was wanting to get to know her better, to maybe be able to propose and get married, yeah, we wouldn't be married right? I put time into that. I planned that. So what I realized is, for those of you that are really struggling, you, you got to plan it. Put time into your schedule. Put it on your schedule. Block it out. I know until I did that, I struggled and struggled and struggled. I'd be great for a while, and then I would just drop right off, because I would be doing it, on, I would be just doing it when I had time. And then when things got really busy, that's when I would lose it again because it wasn't on my schedule. And 2 Timothy said, all scriptures God breathes, useful for training and teaching and righteousness, right? You've got to be in the words. You've got to be in relationship. You're, if you're not, the way I always look at it is um, when you talk about training for a sport, you're always going only one of two ways. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. So if you're training, you're getting better. When you stop, you're getting worse. It's the same way in your relationships. I'm talking all of them, with your spouse, anyone. So if you want your relationship with the Lord, if you want to become a more dedicated Christian, put it on your calendar. Spend time. Make it, it it's not, it is not uh, a cop-out to put him from 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning. Well, gosh, I'm scheduling that time. You probably schedule time to spend time with your wife too, right? When you get life gets busy. Super romantic. She loves that, by the way. When you're like, I got to schedule time to want to be around my wife. <laughs> hey, listen. I told my wife we're going out to dinner tonight. I that said work? I got it scheduled. She's like, yeah. She was so excited because I actually, I planned it, scheduled what it. Man, my wife's like, I'm glad I made it to your schedule. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. <laughs> 
All right, we're not getting into marriage anyway, this time. No, Let's not do I, that. That's it. Yeah. My my advice to this, uh, to answer the question, it's not fun or flashy, but it is to memorize God's word. Mm. Um, something I wish I would have started sooner, but in college, there's this guy that um, I went to a, a session with at a camp, and his name was Max Barnett. He's not not very well known, but he encouraged us to memorize God's word as if as if the Bible was going to disappear and that you were the only one that had memorized it. Because in some countries, like that is the case, they they'll send a missionary and and they'll they'll be the they'll have all God's word or like a whole book of Ephesians in their head, and that's how they share that that truth. And it's not just so you can be like, well, I've memorized the Bible. It's so that when you're praying, that's how God speaks to you. And a lot of times we're like, oh, I want God to speak to me, but through his word is how he's going to communicate that to you. And when you have that, if you truly believe that God's word is sharper than a, than a two-edged sword and it's profitable for anything that you need, then you will take the time to do that. Yeah, you right. gave me a good tool yeah. for that um, a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's been really awesome for my family. Um, Bible Memory app. Bi- Bible Memory. If you search Bible Memory in your app store, you can get it. Um, it's a little bit of a pricey app, but it's totally worth it. Um, and so strongly recommend that. Yep. The only thing that I would add to this is um, I think it's often overlooked, but the most growth I've seen in my life is when I started pointing others to the Lord. And, and yes, you need to know the word to do that. Yes, you need to have it on your heart to do that, right? But it wasn't until that started happening because they asked questions. And then you realize either you're, you're, you're prepared for those questions or you're not. And it, it forces you to realize that if you want to continue this kind of work, you have to, you, you better be ready, yep. right? And so I think that that's an incredibly, incredibly important tool is point others to the Lord. That, that you'll see so much growth in your life, even mm-hmm. if it's getting involved in kids' ministry, youth ministry, whatever it is. Yeah. So. Well, relationship has been mentioned a handful of times. And I, I just, I, in my life, um, when I was in uh, doing my master's, Um, I came across two profs that marked my life. They became mentors that I could turn to at any point in my life, whether it was Bible knowledge, ministry stuff. But then, in addition to having a mentor, which I strongly recommend, somebody that's a few steps beyond where you are, but then a peer, I got to a place where the church I was serving was exploding with uh, growth, and I just felt so unable to to handle that responsibility. There were six other guys that felt the same way, and we ended up getting together. Every year, we'd go to Nashville, and we'd play golf during the day, and then at night, we'd sit in a hot tub or whatever, and, and we would just talk about ministry and life and it kept me strong during some really uh, uh, tempestuous times, I guess I would say. And then I learned that you also need to have someone you are personally discipling, someone who is trying to get on the path. Uh, Howard Hendricks used to say, you have to have a Paul, you have to have a Barnabas, you have to have a Timothy. It's the same thing. You need a mentor, you need a peer, and you need a disciple in your That's life. Good. That's good. Well, Powerful. Let me, let me close out the panel like this, because I think the first thing that we need before we even seek to be a dedicated Christian, uh, for those of you that have not had this yet, before you can do anything, you need an experience with Jesus. And um, you, you, need, you need to hear of his mercy and his grace, and you need to accept him at his word and um, walk in new life. And um, I, I don't know, maybe you're here today and you haven't done that yet. And I would just want to speak to you for a moment. I want you to understand something about who every man up here is, uh, who we were and who we are. And um, I can't think of a better way to close out identity than telling you that uh, if you put me up against the Lord's law, um, I fail miserably. I'm a transgressor, as Scripture would call me. I'm a sinner. And... Um, I'm not going to go through my list for you here today, but I'd be happy to share it with you if you ever want to get coffee. And I'd be happy to share what God has done in my life. Um, But I grew up in a Christian home, and I walked away from him, and I rejected him um, in in some of my most rebellious years. Um, It was interesting. I never never stopped. It it wasn't about belief for me. It was about obedience, Mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and so I always believed, but I always didn't like the fact that I believed, right? Because I knew what it required of me. And so I was just, I was so rebellious in that space. And the Lord just softened my heart and softened my heart and, and brought me back to him. And um, I'm resting in his grace every single day. Um, I have accepted him and I uh, follow him as Lord and he is the savior of my soul. And uh, I just want you to know that that same grace is available to you if you just put your faith and trust in him today. Um, give your life to him and trust him uh, with the things you can't control. Give your life over to him. Um, we have a baptism. We'll baptize you today if you're ready to follow Jesus. Um, and I will tell you this. It's the most uh, amazing decision you will ever make if you decide to put your life in his hands. And so I just want to um, close with prayer. And then we're going to head into a time of communion. Um, this is a time that's a, set aside for believers to um, just remember the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross for our sins. That he became sin. He who had no sin became sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God. This is amazing. And so that's the, that's the message you're invited into today. Um, so let's pray and um, let's enjoy this time of, of worship together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I, I thank you so much for every man on this panel and, and seeing what you're doing in their lives and, and, and seeing the, this, the softness of their heart, uh, their, their love for you and their desire to lead people to know that love and to know that grace and forgiveness in their lives just as we've known it. Lord, I, I thank you for their ministry. Uh, I thank you um, for giving us a call and a purpose that is so much bigger than ourselves. I thank you for the church. Lord, I thank you for this body of believers that you have entrusted us with. Uh, may we be faithful to lead well, not just in word, but in deed. Give us what we need, Lord. And I pray for hearts in this room that have not accepted you. I pray that you would continue to work, Lord. I pray that they would turn their lives over to you um, through an act of faith that they would simply say, you know what, Lord, take over. And that everything would change for them. That new life, Lord, that you've given me is an amazing life. And I'm so grateful. I love you. Thank you for Jesus.